Hi, and welcome to this special series of Ask Dr. Betters. My name is Melissa Weisenfels, and I serve as the executive director here at markinc.org. In this second video, as part of our series, I have the founders of Mark Inc., Chuck and Sharon Betters, with me as I dig into some tough questions about their marriage and how they place their hope in Christ to um, deal with the various trials and sufferings that they have faced over the 50 years that they have been together. So welcome, Chuck and Sharon. Um, thanks for being here and sharing so openly with us um, the personal inside glimpse to the life that you've shared together over the past 50 years. Dr. Betters, I know that you and your wife have suffered, as we talked a bit in part one of our video series, as a result of things outside your marriage, various trials and crises, the loss of your son and breast cancer. Um, but today I want to dig into each of you as individuals. So um, can we address some of the sin issues that you've experienced in your marriage as a result of each other and the sin of um, your spouse? Wow, that's a loaded question because... We don't want to appear as though we're pointing fingers <laughs> at each other. My mother used to say, when you point one finger at somebody else, you're pointing three right back at yourself. <laughs> and uh, I want to make clear to those who are watching this series that uh, when it comes to marriage, there's no one cookie cutter way to make for a successful marriage. I mean, there are people watching this right now who are in abusive relationships. Uh, there are people who are Christians married to non-believers. Uh, there are non-believers watching this who have no common spiritual ground. And so I, I really feel as though it's important for us to say at the beginning, it's somewhat of a disclaimer, that yes, we've had a successful marriage for 50 years, and we will go to our graves with a successful marriage. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everything that worked for us is going to work for them, except what I talked about on the first video which are the non-negotiables of marriage, our personal relationship to Jesus, the fact that we are in a partnership together and respecting one another in that partnership, understanding that she has a lot to bring to the marriage and I have a lot to bring to the marriage and we have a lot to hear and respond to from each other. You know, Paul says in Romans chapter 7 that uh, there's this thing called the flesh, this thing called the spirit uh, and the, the war that goes on between the, the spirit and the flesh. I call it Paul's double talk chapter. When you read the chapter, you walk away scratching your head saying, what did he just say? He seems conflicted. He seems confused. He talks about this war that's going on inside of him of a battle with the flesh. I, th I think I understand where he's coming from. And it goes something like this. Before I became a Christian, before Sharon became a Christian, there's a part of us pre-Christian, before we come to faith in Jesus Christ, there's a part of everyone that is called the flesh. It stays with you after you become a Christian. You still have the flesh. And the flesh through is your will, your intellect, your emotions, how you respond to critical situations, uh, things like your tongue, what you say, your eyes, what you look at, your ears, what you listen to. They are all impacted by influences and environments that come from the outside. Now, when I met Sharon, we met at a restaurant on her last day as being a, a, a waitress at that restaurant. I came in with my, my kid brother and she served us and uh, we hooked up as a result. I like to say I picked her up in a restaurant, uh, but it was probably a little more than that. We have we have quite a testimony that uh, of God's sovereignty. But when she met me and I met her, the flesh in each of us had been severely damaged. In my particular case, I can speak for my environment in which I was raised. There were no moral restraints in the mar in the marriage that I observed as a kid growing up. I lived in my own little private world. My, my parents had a conflictual relationship. Uh, there was a, an extended family that was rooted in difficult sins. I mean, there was, there was some stuff going on in our extended family that was, 
with a little kid going to his grandmother's on the weekend, I saw things, I heard things that impacted my flesh. And so the moral restraints that I now have as a Christian were not there then. But the temptations that came from that pre-Christian era, those temptations are still part of my flesh that is daily being renewed, daily being redeemed. The sanctification process takes all of your earthly years until you get to heaven when God removes every evidence of it. So when I came into the relationship with Sharon, I was damaged goods. Uh, when we moved to Delaware, it was in my senior year of high school. And we moved from West, I moved from Western Pennsylvania to Delaware. I hated it. I hated the move. Um, I was hurt by the move. Uh, I had to establish new friendships and, you know, any, any, anything you can think of that a high school senior would go through in his senior year to move from one state to another. Uh, I was bullied. I was picked on. I had to prove myself over again in sports. And all of those issues produced tremendous loneliness. I was an extremely lonely high school senior. Well, that drove me to a crowd. And that crowd of people it drove me to were not good for me. It drove me into relationships that ended up being terribly damaged. Those relationships ended with brokenness and pain. And when I was a, a freshman in college, there was horrible pain. And then I met her. So I have all these moral restraints being tested, all of the wrong crowd that I had involved myself with. I had no parents to speak of that I could confide in. I was on my own. And so I was making decisions. You know, the Bible tells us that, uh, that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Well, there was plenty of foolishness bound up in my heart. And so I walk into that restaurant that day, and she comes in for, with a different... Why don't you talk a little bit about your background? Well, my background is completely different than Chuck's. I mean, in almost every way. I uh, was raised in a family of seven children. I'm the second oldest. And my father was... Um, you know, he had the look. If you got the look from him, you knew there were no questions asked. I can't remember ever questioning my parents uh, when I was being disciplined, ever. Um, my mother and father were committed to one another. They had a solid marriage, but their way of communication was totally opposite of Chuck's family. Uh, when I first started dating Chuck, He's full-blooded Lebanese, which was very attractive to me. I mean, and I have to go back. The night that I met him, I had come to a point in my life where I was a good church girl, and I was tired of it, and I was ready for some fun because it was very legalistic. We had lots of rules, and I felt as though everybody outside the church was enjoying life and having fun, and I was trying to be this good person, but it wasn't bringing me much satisfaction. And so when I met Chuck, I, I thought he is going to be my ticket to fun. And so we were both coming out of a broken relationship with a previous boyfriend and girlfriend. And so it was probably a pretty dangerous combination between the two of us. Um, and so when we when my first time when I uh, went to Chuck's house, actually over the next few times, I, his family had no restraints. I mean, you, what you see is what you get. And... They would, their way of dealing with conflict was yelling and, uh, I mean, no, no, there were no fences and it didn't matter that I was there. And I remember witnessing some of this and then all of a sudden somebody would say, like his mother, are you guys hungry? Let's have some cake. And then they would all act normal, like nothing had ever <laughs> happened, like there had been no fight, there was no conflict. I never saw anything like that because in my house if we ever had something like that happen, there would be days of silence, you know, days of we, we didn't know how to find our way back to each other. So both families, you know, we brought this into our marriage and we had to figure out how are we gonna do this? You know, my way right, his way right. I wasn't sure, uh, of course I came into a believing my way was the right way with a little tweaking, um, but Chuck came in believe, he knew he knew what he didn't want. And, and I think that was one of the things that um, we've been talking about this that attracted him to me is because I was more peaceful 
I think he thought I was more peaceful. And he talked about when he had to leave uh, his high school and move here, he had described to me, he said, there was so much chaos in my family and loneliness for me and no source of counsel that was meaningful because his parents had terrible burdens to, to carry. And uh, I think they did the best they knew how, but it wasn't about looking at your child and figuring out where they were hurting and you know helping them. And so his safe place was his school and his sports and his friends. So when he came here, he didn't have any of that. And by the time we met, he still had chaos in his life. And I think that that's one of the reasons God brought us together, even though we probably shouldn't have been together. Um, there was a need in me that was being met and a need in him that was being met. But, so so but, when, you bring, when you bring two individuals with those distinctly different backgrounds together into a marital relationship, we were forged together with each other. I mean, that's all we had was each other. And when we fell in love with one another, that love was a scary thing for my family and it was a scary thing for her family. Both families looked at that and they, they were not for it. They were, both families were against us getting married. I don't recommend what we did for young couples today, try to work those things through, but it was because of the vastly different backgrounds from my home to her home and the vastly different religions. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was raised distinctively Roman Catholic. She was raised in a strict uh, Reformed church. And you bring those two together, we fought a lot. We had our own uh, conflicts. She eventually packed her bags and moved 600 miles away before we got married, left a dear Chuck note on my door. Uh, and it was a painful time for both of us. Painful time for my family. My father loved her. My mother loved her. Uh, her parents, I think, could tolerate me. <laughs> but uh, but it, was a, it was a tough, tough time that seemed to piggyback on the previous tough times that we were going through. Well, all of that damages your flesh. All of that conflict, if you're not a Christian, it damages your flesh. You look for control. You look to figure out a way to maneuver. You learn how to plot. You learn how to um, maybe even use and abuse one another. And the only hope that we had was that somehow or another we'd be able to get on the same page spiritually. And that's when God intervened and he brought me to faith in Christ. Nobody, rightfully nobody, believed me except her. Uh, and I might condition that her aunt also believed me because she was the one that was kind of working side by side with me. But nobody else believed me. They all thought it was a plot. It was, a, it was just, Chuck wants his way, he's gonna get his way, and he wants this woman, and he's gonna get this woman, and now he's gonna play the religion game in order to get her. And that's what I would have thought. If I was them, I would have thought the same thing. When we walk the aisle, when I walk the aisle, when I went down front and she was coming after me, I thought to myself, are you sure you know what you're doing? Because we were so vastly, vastly different. And that was the infancy of our marriage where we're bringing those fallen flesh characteristics into the home. Now she has to live with that. And I have to live with that. Uh, at the top of the list was how do you blend two distinctly different family backgrounds into something where neither one of us lose our identity. Both of us have to give something. Both of us have to willing to take something. And then we have to find that common ground, like two overlapping circles. In the middle, there is the answer somewhere. And you have to find that. And in the early years of the marriage, that was not an easy thing to find. Well, I think our listeners can relate to the struggles of the flesh in our childhoods and our upbringings and um, the experiences that, that we have that shape who we are. Um, we all have them. We all have a story um, from our upbringing before our marriage, before we find someone um, that we are committing and vowing to spend our, the rest of our lives with. And as you mentioned, you bring those experiences and those temptations and those sins into your, into your marriage. 
But then how and what specifically, which sins do you feel like really um, reared its head, really presented itself in your marriage, um, either in yourself or in your spouse, um, however you'd like to tackle the question, and um, how did you address that? Well, I, I think pride is right at the top of the list. I know that I'm right. You know, I could see the flaws in Chuck's family very clearly. And I knew that uh, I didn't want those in our marriage. And so I knew I was right. And uh, so that's pretty tough when you go into a relationship believing that you're the one who's right and you're the one who's in charge of making sure that the other person doesn't make mistakes. And secondly, I was a people pleaser. I didn't realize that. And I think for Christians, it's hard to, to delineate sometimes whether Am I doing this, am I living because I want to please the Lord, or am I doing this because I want to please people? Sometimes the action is the same. You wouldn't change your behavior, but your motivation can lead you down a very dangerous path. And I struggled with people pleasing, oh my goodness, almost all my life. Um, and Chuck did not view life through that grid. So lots of times I would try to get him to behave in a certain way because I was worried about what people were going to say and think. And here I am, a pastor's wife. And so I'm, I know people are watching. I know that um, they might be judging. And so let's be perfect. Let's try to be perfect. That's sinful. You know, I, I couldn't be perfect, and neither could he. So, uh, so I think pride, and it rears its head in, in very subtle ways. We can think we're being very spiritual when actually we're being very prideful. Um, selfish, you know, I want my way, I guess that goes in with pride. Manipulation, trying to manipulate him into thinking the way that I wanted him to think. And sometimes he would just give in to me and it wasn't pretty, you know, and, I, and then I would feel guilty because I think, well, this isn't what I wanted. I wanted him to do this uh, because he knows it's the right thing to do. So I would, I would name my sin as uh, pride selfishness, manipulation, people pleasing. You bring that into a marriage and it could be explosive. Yeah, I would say pride was a significant part of my sin pattern, but it's a special kind of pride. And I condition this with by saying that there is a there is a pride element to fear when we are afraid. And I know when I'm afraid, I get angry. And that's how I express my, my fear of whatever the situation is. I express it with anger. And I don't choose my words the right way. I don't choose them carefully. And it's taken many, many years. I still struggle with it. Um, like uh, Sharon has a medical condition that I know when she's looking at her watch, she's measuring her heartbeat. And I'll look over to her. She's, she's, look, she's looking at it secretly. <laughs> And I'll say, are you having an episode? And she'll say, yes, but I was afraid to tell you because I know how you're going to react. <laughs> and the way I'm going to react is I try not to do it, but it's fear. It's anger. Like she interprets that as I'm angry with her. I'm not angry with her. I'm angry at the situation that she has to struggle with something like this. Because most of my fallen flesh was damaged by fear. There was a lot of fear watching your parents act the way my parents acted and watching the, the way in which we were thrown together with no support. And then the early years of our ministry, which we'll talk about uh, in the next video, those were, those were frightening days. Um, knowing what kind of trouble I got into in high school and I'm studying pre-med at the university and taking very difficult courses. And I'm watching the struggle with my grades because of the conflicts that we were all having at the time. It was very difficult to focus and, and that fear gets in there. And then you, you start figuring out, well, what, what do I have to do to get out of this? And that's pride. It's not submitting yourself to God's will and God's purpose. So for me, my pride surfaces its head especially when I'm afraid, when, I, when I'm fearful of something. So in terms of handling conflict, when I try to handle conflict with individuals, there are times when I have to guard myself against getting angry with them. But real, what I'm really doing is I'm battling fear at that point because 
I might say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing or act the wrong way. I mean, Sharon used to get upset with me when I would run the vacuum cleaner uh, because my mother cleaned the clean. My mother was fastidious at a clean house. Her mother was not the same way. She had seven kids and, and her house was often cluttered. unkempt. Cluttered. Cluttered. <laughs> and, and so when I would pick up the vacuum cleaner, your reaction was? I was offended. Didn't I do a good enough job? You know, and, and the answer was no. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't do a good enough job. But he never told me that. But I knew that's what it was all about. You know, and, and when I tell that story to young wives today, they're like, "You got to be kidding me!" If my husband picked up the vacuum cleaner. I'd say, "Hallelujah!" Answered <laughs> prayer. But I was a people pleaser, and so any hint that I wasn't doing a good enough job, it would be like a knife. To me. And guess who 50 years later still does the vacuum? Uh, yeah, he does it all. Well, that's impressive. <laughs> She's turned it over. And I have no problems with that. And now you, it doesn't offend you any longer. Not at all. He can vacuum to his heart's content. <laughs> that's right. So um, to wrap up the sin um, question in your spouse, I think it would be important for us um, to really unpack some practical ways for our listeners to properly address um, maybe um, some tips of how to point sin out in your spouse in a healthy, helpful um, way to point them back to Christ, to really rebuke them in love. Um, what practical ways could you give our listeners about how to really address sin, whether it be in yourself, um, to not have a defensive posture or to point it out in, the sp in your spouse when it's an issue? Well, um, it's hard. It's very difficult because you don't want to hurt your spouse. When you see things, when I see things in her that need to change, one of the ways in which I do that is I ask the Lord, what in me is, what sin pattern is there in me that may be causing her to react that way? What is there that she, what is she afraid of that she's observing in me that will trigger something in her where she wants to go off in a certain direction. And that's self-examination. When you start examining your own heart and you start looking at the sin in your own life, all of a sudden, her sin doesn't become such a big matter. When, when you have so much to deal with yourself, when you have so much homework to do in your own soul, it's, I think it's more difficult to start pointing out the sins in another. And, and then, then you find gracious words in which to do that, gracious ways in which to do that. You think that's the best way to handle this? Do you think maybe, there, maybe there's another way we could take a look at? Or maybe we could say that a different way. I can't tell you over the years how many angry letters I have written as a pastor to deal with conflict where I read it to her and she would say, you can't send that, you, you can't send that. So there's so much hurt that could have been caused out there that she prevented because she knew what my anger was, it was fear. And you know, to deal with the sin in my life at that point. So it comes back to that thing where you're pointing the finger at somebody and three fingers are looking back at you I think that's a critical way in which to point out a sin in another because then you find gracious words to use. You find a gracious way to say it because your sin becomes magnified against the backdrop of her sin. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I agree with that. But I also think for my, me personally, um, it goes back to that people-pleasing thing. And I was very defensive in our first years of marriage. I mean, totally defensive. And you have... A man coming from a family where you say whatever you're thinking, you don't you don't put it through any kind of a grid of uh, is this going to hurt the person? Is this going to upset them? There was never any thought that I observed in their family relationships where anyone was careful about their words, and so this was the way Chuck lived life. And I mean, there's something good to be said about that because there's an honesty and and. I don't want anybody to think the wrong thing. I loved Chuck's family, and I loved the uh, Middle Eastern um, DNA, and we tried to incorporate that into our own family. I loved that. But so you're taking this man who 
is um, youth just spouting off whatever he wants to, and you got this tender-hearted, sweet little girl who gets <laughs> her feelings hurt if you look at her the wrong way, and you have, uh, there were some silent moments in our house, days of silence, um, and, and Chuck would be clueless as to what in the world did I say or do, you know? So now that I'm older and wiser, <laughs> I still have to struggle with defensiveness, um, but it's not, it, it doesn't create conflict in our home the way it did in those early years. And one of the, um, you know, you ask about how do I, how, how in a marriage do you help your spouse to see those dark places? And I think, like Chuck said, you have to look at yourself. You have to be really careful that this is sin and not a preference. Um, and I think that changes your conversation. But I, for a Christian, for me personally, um, I'm learning the power of prayer. And, and not just in my marriage, but for others that I love, where I see them going on a different track than I, wish have, that, that I think they should be on, is to um, extend love to my husband, is how can I love him better today? Um, prayer, Lord, is this something where you want me to speak up or is there another way? Releasing that person knowing that it's not up to me to fix them or change them. It's up to me to set the table and ask them to come and taste and see that the Lord is good. And that counts in our marriage too, is um, recognizing he's got to stand before the Lord I, I, without me in front of him. And so I, it goes back to those non-negotiables in marriage where our relationship to Christ must be the grid through which we communicate. And it is not easy. It is so hard um, because we are sinners. And But if we don't, the other part of it is keeping a clean slate. It could be that keeping a clean slate is approaching our spouse, recognizing this is not the right time, they're not ready to hear, so we keep a clean slate before the Lord hmm. and humble ourselves and say, forgive me for those words I shouldn't have said and show me where I can be humble to my spouse. You know, there's such a thing as generational sin. Uh, now, there's a lot of bad theology out there about generational sin because the tendency would be to blame our parents or to blame their parents. But understanding your own heart means that you understand where it came from and, and how to deal. It's like history. It's learning history so that you don't repeat the mistakes of the past. And so, but generational sin can be broken. The chains can be broken, and it's broken when we take our sins and the sins of our spouse to the cross rather than to blame them and throw dirt on them. And I think to me that's the most important thing to do is to take whatever sins I see in her or sins that I see in myself, take them to the cross and figure out a way to lay them there. Chuck, Sharon, thank you so very much for being so open and honest about uh, yourselves and, and each other and your marriage. Um, it was certainly convicting as well as encouraging, and I hope our listeners um, are able to see a bit of themselves as well as take away some of the key tips that you've given about placing Christ first and foremost at the center of their marriage, as well as um, the importance of, of forgiveness and humility and um, really putting the other Loving the other before loving self um, is really the takeaway that I've, I've heard from you all this morning. Um, I encourage each and every one of you listening to this video to visit markinc.org to check out the variety of resources that we have available to you free of charge um, on, on all kinds of topics that just share stories of redemption and testimony that give help and hope to, to those who are hurting, as well as to encourage you to persevere faithfully um, in the journey that God has set forth for you. Um, also, if these videos and resources have been helpful to you, we hope that you will consider prayerfully giving to markinc.org so that we can continue to produce and distribute them free of charge to those who need them. Um, coming up next in our third um, part of this series, we will be talking about the early years of their marriage as well as how to um, take a look at disappointments versus resentments and the possibility of bitterness that builds up in marriage over time. We hope you'll join us. Thank you for watching this series on Raw Marriage produced by Mark Inc. Ministries. For a gift of any size, you can receive a copy of this series by following the link below or visiting markinc.org.